All right, guys. Okay, so uh, being a mom, I would imagine, I'm not a mom, but I would imagine it's not always easy. It's probably very difficult when, uh, um, when life is difficult. You still have to parent, you know? That, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. I think uh, over the past year, like, that's, that, that's really been showcased is, is no matter what's on the news or ma- no matter how difficult the conversations or work or whatever, like, like we still have to, to go on with life. We still got to do certain things. No matter if you're a mom or a dad or if you don't have any kids, the truth is sometimes life is really, really, really difficult, right? Sometimes it's one thing after another after another, and we don't want to, like, get in this spot, but it can feel like God is out to get us. Or maybe that God has just forgotten us because it's just one thing after another after another. I want you to grab your Bibles, and I want you to, to turn to the book of Ruth. All right, the book of Ruth, after the book of Judges, before the book of First Samuel. It's this little four-chapter book. And today I want to introduce you to a mom named Naomi, a mom that, that can relate to it being one thing after another after another. Trial, difficulty, strain, constantly. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ruth chapter 1, or get your YouVersion uh, app out and turn to Ruth uh, chapter 1. And today we're going to see... Now, Naomi, everything was, was going fine for Naomi until it wasn't, all right? And my guess is you've been there. Everything's fine until it's not, all right? Everything is fine until uh, the, the, the doctor gives you a certain diagnosis. Everything is fine until uh, the refrigerator, the, uh, the hot water tank, and the garage door uh, all break at the same time, because that obviously always happens at the same time, right? Like, we, we know that, all right? But, but maybe, like, life is fine until... It's not, till the phone call, till the layoff, till the, the finances were, were in, in, in dire straits. Like, like, everything's fine until it's not. This is the story of Naomi. See, everything was fine until it wasn't. And for her, it was a famine, a famine in the, the nation of Israel. So you open up uh, Ruth chapter 1, and you, you see that there's a famine in the land. Okay, now what we're going to see today is that, that Naomi and her husband Elimelech, all right, Elimelech, uh, they're going to they're gonna send their, their family, they're going to take their family on a course that's going to have a massive impact on the rest of their life, a huge, huge impact. It's going to be filled with trial, with tragedy, with difficulty, and it's ultimately going to point to hope. But today is what I want us to, to see, kind of our big idea of the week, as we dive into Ruth chapter 1, is that struggles in life often lead to struggles in faith. When life isn't going according to plan, when there's tragedy, when there's despair, when there's overwhelm, when there is anxiety, when there's depression, when, when, when things just aren't going great, it often shows itself in our faith. When, when there's difficulty, it often shows itself in an apathetic faith, a, a strained faith. Maybe we feel very distant from God today, and maybe that's where we're at. Maybe it has felt just like, like one thing after another, and so today we come in and and something's just not right between us and our Savior. It's just, there's, there's a little distance. I mean, we're here in church, we're at least doing that, right? But there's just a little distance today. Struggles in life often lead to struggles in faith. See, we know that, that strain changes us, right? If you've ever been in a serious season of grief, or you've known somebody in a serious season of grief, you know that that can radically change who you are, can change your personality, can change your perspective. Like, like it, it drastically changes us. But it can also have a massive impact on our faith, have a massive impact on, on who we are and, and what we struggle with because strain and trial can lead us to making decisions, small little decisions that one after another after another create such a distance between us and God. Right, the trial, the, the, the tragedy, the, the, the difficulty, we, we handle that with one little decision after little decision. And before we know it, there's a, a major strain in our relationship with Jesus. We see the evidence of this in this very first verse. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. All right, so right here we're going to see that the, the, the trial, that strain, that struggle has a, a faith impact because right here, There shouldn't be a famine. Think about this. This is the promised land. 
This is the land, if you've read your Old Testament, this is the land that's supposed to be flowing with milk and honey. It's supposed to be fertile, it's supposed to be wonderful. Like, like this is the land that the people waited years and decades for to finally get to, and now there's a famine. That should cause some red flags. We often, like, like what we're going to see in Ruth chapter 1, we often just read right through this, but there's some, some things that, that we need to point out right here. There's a famine in the promised land. Like, this shouldn't be, but it's a showcase. The trial, that strain, leads to a distance of, uh, uh, in, in our relationship with God, and that leads to sin, and that leads to consequences. Right here in Leviticus 26, it says, I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Right? When we begin to, to lead a life apart from God, it's going to have massive consequences. Right? And we see this played out. And the fact that the people of Israel, God's chosen people, are experiencing a famine in the very land that's supposed to be the most fertile on the planet. It's because strain and trial and heartache leads to a distance from God, and that leads to sin, and sin leads to consequences. We see this play out in Naomi. Everybody say Naomi. Naomi. I don't know how much you know about Naomi. The book is titled Ruth. We'll get to, to her here in a little bit. But Naomi is an interesting story because we see that, that strain and trial begin to have a faith impact in her own life. So there is a, a famine in the land and, and her and her husband Elimelech decide to take their family to Moab. Everybody say Moab. 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 That, that's very crucial in this story. All right. So it's one of those things we just read right through, but Moab is not Israel. In fact, Moab is the enemy of Israel. They are taking their family into enemy territory. Don't fly through this. Moab has a completely different God. His name is Chemosh. You can like look him up. His name is Chemosh. They found ancient things that refer to Chemosh, the God of the Moabites, right? And and they would practice deep, dark, uh, just just very sinful things. They they would have um, child sacrifice to the, the God of Chemosh, Right, this was a normal thing. And, and, and so, so Elimelech and Naomi move their family there. They leave the, the, the nation of Israel and they, they move their family there because it seems like that's the logical thing to do, right? I mean, they're having a hard time growing things. And so it seems like the logical thing, except for some, some details. There's not like this big, big record of a bunch of Israelites going into Moab at this time. In fact, you're going to read here in the next few verses. You're going to see it sure sounds like, sure looks like Elimelech and Naomi were about the only ones that did this. All right, about the only ones that, that, that actually left Israel. And we see something play out. Elimelech and Naomi were making a conscious decision to leave their faith family. They were making a conscious decision. They, they are the people of Israel. And they made the conscious decision to, you know what, it's strain, it's difficulty, it's hard right here, so we're going to leave our group and we're going to come over here and live with the Moabites. There's a a quote that I I heard this week um, that just fit along perfect with this. It says, people usually drift away from their community of faith before they drift away from faith. Right? People often drift away from their community of faith as a precursor to drifting away in their faith, right? If, if the last year has taught us anything, it's that it's very, very easy to drift away from a community of faith, right? Like we've learned that, like, like maybe more than ever before, because whether we watch online or, or whether we're here in person, like, like our habits were changed, right? Our routines were changed. It got very easy, like, like, like crazy easy to not go to church, right? I mean, it just, it just has, or, or it's become very easy to, to maybe watch a little less if we're watching online. And it's what we see right here, and I truly believe that that quote is spot on, is that, that when we begin to, to grow distant in our faith community, it's often a precursor that we're going to grow distant in our faith. Now, we can choose to do that, there's no one forcing you to, to, to be a part of a, a group of believers. There's no one forcing you to, to watch online when you can't be here in person. There's no one forcing you to do that. But when we pull away, when we pull away from a faith family, it has consequences. And often it's a precursor of us pulling away 
in our relationship with Jesus. I would imagine that most of the people in here have specific people that they can think of that, that kind of left this church or another church or, or whatever and slowly grew distant in their faith, right? It has consequences. And this is what happens in the family of Elimelech and Naomi. They separate from their family, from their faith family, and it has consequences. Because there's something universal, whether you are a part of a church or you're not, is life is hard, right? Like, like everybody in here has that in common. Like, like trials are going to come. Just because you decide to follow Christ, just because you're a part of a, a faith family, it sure doesn't mean that life gets easy, right? I mean, you could make the argument that, that when you become a Christian, life gets more difficult, right? And so we sure don't want to buy into the lie that if you just believe in God, all your problems are going to be gone. No, they might multiply. You might have some serious uh, earthly consequences to this, right? And so there's a difference, though. If we don't have a faith family, if we're not plugged in, if, if we're not building relationships, we don't have accountability. We don't have support. We don't have encouragement when life hits because it's going to hit. And it's going to hit Elimelech and Naomi. They think it's bad because there's a famine. It hadn't even started yet. Right? Like, like, like where we're at in life, maybe it's, it's not the most pleasant thing, but we have to understand something that, that isn't easy to talk about. There are some very difficult days coming. And if we pull away from a faith family, there's going to be consequences. We see this play out. Eventually, Elimelech dies, all right? Her husband dies. We can, can read this in uh, uh, verse 3. It says, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, we don't know the details. That's literally all we know about Elimelech's death. He dies. But what we know is that she is now all alone with her two boys, all right? What we know is that, that grief and heartache and despair, like it was tough First, with the famine. Now there's a famine, and the leader of the family is gone. Just like that. He's just gone. And so we're going to begin to see kind of a sequence of things. How things begin to happen when, when the strain and the trial and the struggle begin to build up. Right? It's not just a famine. Now it's a famine and a loss. Now we're, we're, we're separated from our faith family, and now there's going to be massive consequences from this. Heartache, often leads to sin. Eventually, the two uh, rowdy boys that, that she had mature, and they, they, they grow up, and they marry two Moabite ladies, all right? So if you're just reading uh, in, in chapter one, it says the, um, his wife's name, Naomi, and the names of two sons were Malon and Kilion, uh, and, and these two boys marry two Moabite ladies. This is another detail to not fly through. Right? They are marrying ladies that are not Israelites. This is deeply sinful. Deeply sinful in the law of Moses. In fact, it's like, it's like very clear. It says this, Do not intermarry with them, them being non-Israelites. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from the following, uh, following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. They blew past this. And this is what often happens in trial, in grief, in struggle. When life isn't going according to plan, we just blow past sin. It just doesn't even matter anymore. Right? We, just, we, we forget about the, the, the teachings of, of our childhood. We, we forget about the, the foundations of our faith. And it's often when we're lonely, when we're anxious, when we're hurting, that sin stops being a big deal. Because sin is often the coping mechanism to take a little of the pain off. Right? And so we, we begin to practice different things just like them. They married Moabite women. Like deeply sinful in that day. And, and, and for us, we blow past things just to try to take a little bit of the edge off. And so maybe it's, it's what we watch on TV, or, or maybe it's giving in to a lust, or entering in some relationship we have no business being in. Maybe it's drinking a little alcohol just to take the, the pain away, just a little bit. Right? Maybe it's taking some painkillers, maybe it's doing just a little something to take the edge off. And so we can relate to this, that pain and trial and struggle often leads to us overlooking sin. And so we grow distant. And I think we can all relate to this. 
in the seasons of grief, in the seasons of struggle, in the seasons of despair, when things aren't going according to plan, when, when life is not going as it should, man, we often find ourselves so distant from God in the very time that we could be growing incredibly close to Him. But it doesn't have to be this way. All right, so whether you're a mom or not, like, like if we're in a struggle right now, it doesn't have to lead to like this, this distance between us and our Savior. We don't have to come in here and it feels so forced. So that's Mother's Day. I guess I should like go to church. It doesn't have to feel this way. There's a couple of reasons why, and I want to talk to you about this really quick. Number one, through the struggle, God is still at work. So through your pain, through your heartache, through your, your, your overwhelm, how one thing after another is just not going how it's supposed to, God is still at work in your life. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is at work in your life. He is at work in your life. Whatever you are going through, God is at work. See, eventually, things go from bad to worse. The heartache and the strain and the pain, it's not over for Naomi. All right, so first it was a famine. And then we leave home. So she's left all her family and her, her, her relatives and that sort of thing. Then her husband dies. Then her two boys die. We don't know the details. All we know is they're dead. And so like, like things have just got overwhelming for Naomi. I mean, this is not how life was supposed to go. And I know that there are so many of us in this room right now or watching online that we can relate to that sentence. This isn't how life was supposed to go. And so we, we come in and we, we see this, this dark picture. It's a future that she never pictured, a future she never wanted. Eventually, Naomi tells uh, Orpah and Ruth that she's going to move back home. She's going to go back to Israel, all right? She's heard that the, the famine is now ending, and she's going to go back to, uh, to Israel. And, and so at the beginning, these two ladies go with her, like they're, they're going on the journey with her. But then she's like, you know what? Don't go. Go back to Moab. Go back to your people. Go be with your mom, all right? Go, 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 go hang out with them. I'm going to go by myself. And, and I want to read a passage because something happens. And, and truthfully, it's of monumental importance, and we're going to see why here in a second. One of the, the daughters-in-law, they say, no, I'm not going to go back. And instead, they, they kind of nudge their way in to staying with Naomi. So I'm going to read a chunk of Scripture. We're going to read, get your Bibles out. We're going to read Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to go 8 through 18, because this is really going to set the scene for the rest of the series, all right? For the next three weeks, we're going to go through one chapter of Ruth a week. And so I want us to read this chunk just so we're all on the same page with, with kind of how this story is starting. So pain, heartache, suffering, loss. All right, this is heavy grief. This is heavy despair. This is tons of tears. This is depression. This is loneliness. Here we go in verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown, your, uh, shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So she's like, go, go get married. You're young, go get married. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come to me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they, they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Verse 16 says, but Ruth replied, Do, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything uh, but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. 
Well, on the surface, this might seem like, like maybe like a disobedient daughter-in-law. We're getting a glimpse into something. We're getting a glimpse into how God, through our trials, through our heartache, through our despair, through our mourning, He is weaving His story through our life. He is at work behind the scenes in your life. It doesn't always feel like it. I can guarantee you, Naomi, it sure didn't feel like God is at work, but something's going on here. Because what you may or may not know, and what we're going to really see throughout the rest of this series, is Ruth has a special story. Right? Ruth be- ultimately becomes the, the, uh, the great, 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 great granddaughter, or grandmother of Jesus Christ. Right? Because of her loyalty to Naomi, she enters into the lineage of Jesus Christ. God uses ordinary people to weave an extraordinary tale. So I don't know what you're going through, but I know this. I know God is at work behind the scenes in your life. And, and, and what do we know with, with Naomi? When did, when did everything change for Naomi? When did the, the story kind of change tones? It changes the tone when she decides to return to Israel. Everything kind of shifts when she decides to right the wrong that her and her family has made. She begins to make this conscious decision to go back with her people. And it's at that very point, like that, that can't be a coincidence. It's at that very point that she deals with her past sin that everything begins to change. doesn't mean hard times aren't coming. doesn't mean that the, the, the grieving is over. It's not. But her life, her story, begins to change when she becomes obedient. The story becomes and, and works towards a masterpiece when she becomes obedient to the Father. God is at work in your life. Believe it. Don't let the emotion of the moment make it feel like God stopped caring about you. He hasn't. God is at work in your life. There's another reason that the the strain and the struggle don't have to lead to a strain and struggle in your faith. Second thing, our struggles don't define us. The pains of your life, the mistakes that you and I have made, they don't have to define who we are going forward. I want to read another chunk of Scripture, verses 19 through 21. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? She's like coming back and no one else had left, but but can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She is allowing the pains of life, the difficulty, the strain, the struggle, the heartache to define her future. She's allowing all the things that she's done, all the mistakes that she made, like, oh, Naomi's back. The lady that actually left us, she's back. And and she's allowing this to, to define her because she's changing her name. And this is crucial to the story, all right? Naomi's like, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, all right? These two names, Naomi means pleasant, probably in your Bible at the, one of the footnotes, all right? It means pleasant. Mara means bitter. Don't call me Naomi. I'm bitter. Life has not gone how it's supposed to go, right? And so I look in the mirror, and I don't see Naomi. I see Mara. I see bitterness. I see pain. I see struggle. I see heartache. I see one thing after another. I see what could have been, what should have been, but isn't. So don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because I'm bitter. And man, if there's ever emotion that so many of us can relate to when life isn't going how it's supposed to go. When it's one thing after another after another, we can come into church, but it doesn't mean we're not calling ourselves Mara. It doesn't mean we're, we're, we're not bitter with the, the struggle that we're in. But the very next verse is probably my favorite verse in the entire chapter. All right, so, so she's like, call me Mara, all right? Call me Mara. The very next verse. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Call me Mara. 
the rest of the Bible calls her Naomi. Who does God call her? Naomi. Right? So in this moment of like, like she's consumed with bitterness, frustration, anger, like, like change who I am, like, like call me Mara. No, I'm going to call you Naomi because I know you better than you know you. Life is difficult, but we can't let the emotions of life determine our identity and how we see ourselves. We can't take these things with us because he doesn't see Mara when he sees you. He sees Naomi. God doesn't see you how you see you. He doesn't see you how you see you. You see when you look in the mirror sometimes, and we can all relate to this, we see abandoned. He sees chosen. We see sinful. He sees forgiven. We see unworthy. He sees a child or an heir or an heiress. We see someone who has no potential. He sees someone with infinite fruit to bear if they just attach to the vine. We see someone who's wasted their life. He sees a new creation. We see unlovable. He sees loved. We see a distant being when we look at God. He sees a friend when he looks at us. We see all the physical things we hate about ourselves. He sees a temple. We see weakness. He sees workmanship. Stop calling yourself Mara. Your name is Naomi. Don't let the past define you. He knows who you are. And you are beloved. You are chosen. You are forgiven. You are loved. And in those moments where, where life is just not going and we're, we're in this muck, we're in this just struggle, just like Naomi was, he was still weaving his story through her life. And he still knew who she was. And who she was was not how she saw herself. Big idea of the week, struggles in life often lead to struggles in faith. And maybe right now, we are living that. Maybe right now, like, like because life isn't going according to plan, because the marriage is a little rough right now, because finances are a little rough, our health is a little rough, work is a little rough, because of the tension of the day, we're beginning to see that impact our faith because our faith isn't where it once was. If that's you today, I want you to know that that's a pretty normal thing, right? It's pretty normal for, for the struggles of life to impact our faith, but it doesn't have to be this way. This can be the time that your faith explodes, right? Your faith becomes something that, that you didn't even know was capable because God is weaving his story through your life, and he knows you. The, 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 the pains and the, the, the past, it doesn't define us. He defines us. We've got to stop calling ourselves Mara and bitter when our name is Naomi, when our name is pleasant. You can come out of this bitterness, pain, and frustration and begin to see that God has plans for your life because Naomi is going to be a part of something incredible. All right, what we're going to see play out over the next three weeks, it's like blow your mind how, how it felt like for Naomi the story had been told. Right? Life was, was over. Elimelech was dead. Her boys were dead. And so, so in my life, this, this is just, my, my life has wasted away. But Naomi didn't know something. There was sun shining on the other side of the clouds. Right? That the, the darkness was so heavy that she was blind to the fact that there was a sun shining. And, and that one day that sun is going to pierce through. And her life is going to be one of immense blessing greater than anything we can fathom. I don't know if we have relation to Jesus Christ in, in our lineage, but they get to be a part of this story. Because above the darkness in your life right now, there is a sun shining. We've all seen it as we've, we've flown, we've pierced through the clouds, and all of a sudden it's bright. God loves you. And right now, for many of us, it's heavy, it's, it's dark, and we are growing so distant, but it doesn't have to be this way. If you are in that season right now, know that God loves you. He loves you so, so much. So much so that he sent his son to die on the cross for you so that you don't have to live in this sin. The sin doesn't have to define you. He's weaving his story through your life. And if we can, can align our life with, with the call on it that, that he's given us, we get to be a part of an extraordinary tale.
because he knows who we are. He defines who we are. Let's bow our heads today. It's easy in the, uh, the strains of life to be blinded. It's easy in the strains of life to grow so distant from God. We've seen it play out in our loved ones. We've seen it play out in ourself. And maybe we're seeing it right now. Maybe when we look in the mirror, we see Mara and not Naomi. We see bitterness. We see pain. We see what could have should have been and it's beginning to impact our walk with Jesus if that's you today and the struggles and the pain and the heartache like struggles and pain and heartache they're always going to be around that's life but if if it's starting to have a faith impact and I'm growing bitter I'm growing frustrated I'm growing distant in my relationship with Jesus if that's you today I just want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going uh, to make it to where everybody knows who. But if that's you today, you're, just, you're struggling in your walk with Jesus today because of the, the pains of life. I want you to raise your hand today. I see hands. I see hands. I see you. God, we come today knowing that life is difficult. Knowing that that it does not always go according to our plan. It rarely does. But God, through it, you're weaving a story. Through it, you care about us. You know us. You see our heartache. You see our tears. And may your love begin to define us. May we see ourselves how you see us. May we align our life with your call so that we can be a part of an incredible story. Father, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.